So first thing first, how are you? I'm fantastic, thank you. That's good to hear. So before we jump into what you've been up to lately, um, what was the first album you ever bought? The first album was an orchestrated version from the greatest hits from Queen, the okay. rock band. Yeah. So I suppose this is a long time ago, so why this album? Uh, I always loved orchestra. Okay. Uh, that's basically the music I grew up with, so the music my parents played. And then one of my cousins brought me into Queen. Mm. He played Queen to me and I really liked it. And then there was a TV ad for Queen orchestrated. Okay. So I thought, oh, that's amazing. And I saved my, the money that I got from my parents and bought that on a cassette, not on vinyl, but on the cassette. Back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> How did you go from that kind of music, orchestra, uh, Queen, to kind of where you are now? How did, how did you get introduced into this kind of world of electronic music? I mean, the electronic music, I really also grew up with it okay. because it was my teenage uh, days, which were the 90s. So, and in Germany in the 90s, it was all electronic, it was all techno mm. back then. So, I really, really uh, liked it back then. And I went to the early, like the Love Parade early back right. then in Berlin and reincarnation rave in okay. Hanover, Hanover, I think in 1996 or 1997, around that time. Um, so, yeah, I, I really also grew up with that. How much of music in this period were you, were you making yourself already? Um, back then I wasn't producing music okay. because uh, there was no way to produce music on a computer. I, I mean, I was, <laughs> I was making music on Mario, uh, Mario Paint, right? right? And right. I had a PC where you could just like chip tune stuff. But I was mostly creating my own music, just uh, playing on the piano, like improvising on the piano and okay. writing my own songs on the piano. So that's how it started for me, like the creative part. And then looking at where you are now, then does that background in, in playing piano and that the kind of the, the joy in orchestra, uh, orchestra does, does that help you in your compositions now? I would definitely say it influence, influences me a lot um, mm. because you automatically draw from all the experience that you have. And I, I mean, I conducted the choir and condu conducted an orchestra. Uh, I played in a jazz band for a long okay. time, so I made a lot of different experience. I was singing in a choir, classical choir, but also modern choir. So I made a lot of experiences and, and automatically I draw from those experiences, of okay. course. And when did you, because, well, doing all these different types of things, when did you kind of realize, well, this, this producing uh, music, this, this can actually work, this is something I enjoy, but it's also something I can make a living out of? It was a very conscious decision because okay. uh, as a teenager I wanted to become a conductor. Okay. Uh, so I was uh, learning a lot about classical music and practicing piano a lot. But when I was about to study conducting, before that, a little bit before that, I realized that the cla classical music market is not for me because it's just mm. not creative enough. Mm. So I was thinking, okay, what would be a conductor today? And I ended up, okay, that would actually be a producer. Okay. And especially I find it funny when you think about producer slash DJ. Right. That combination, it's really similar to a conductor because sometimes today people blame DJs for, oh, they're doing everything before the show. Mm -hmm. And in the show, it's just very little what they do. They basically wave their hands in the air, which is exactly what a conductor do. They, <laughs> they do all the important work before the show. And then at the actual show, they're just waving their hands in the air. Right? <laughs> oh, fair enough. Yeah. That's an interesting. I've never heard that before. So that's an interesting. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, I find it funny that people sort of sometimes blame DJs for that, but a conductor has always been very respected, right. and they're not like they're the highest earning classical music musician sort of. Um, but um, they're not paid because they can wave their hands uh, right. specifically. <laughs> sure. It's all the work they do before, like when a great conductor would have do the rehearsals a very like a beginner conductor could still uh, uh, uh conduct the actual show so that's not the problem it's all in the rehearsals right oh, that's very interesting and then when things started to take off when kind of things became a little bit more successful um i don't know exactly what what year this was but it, I, I imagine it being before kind of the whole edm thing blew up um so what was your approach to how you wanted to have your career or how you wanted to kind of navigate this industry? 
Um, my approach as an artist was to navigate out of the industry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because okay. I started as a music producer for 10 years, I was just producing for right. other artists. I wasn't okay. even like, I was ghost producing for DJs. I was producing for like singers and uh, pop bands and whatever came along and TV shows and those things. And uh, then I was just like, at some point, kind of tired of all that. Mm. I thought, like, okay, I'm just going to make the music that I love and just put it out there and see what happens. So there was like, basically, just get out of the industry okay. and do my very own thing. What, was that a difficult thing to do, especially these days, I suppose, with all the labels and everything that's going on? And you like to kind of keep it close to, to yourself. So yeah. uh, is that a difficult thing to do or do you... How, how did you deal with it or do you deal with it? Yeah, you need a, it's not difficult. You need a certain degree of discipline mm. when people come to you and think like, yeah, this is amazing. We would like to work with you and to keep saying, no, um, I'm going, just going to do it by myself or I just very consciously choose the people that I'm working with. Especially also they start throwing money at you, you know, uh, just to keep saying no. It's more a matter of discipline. Right. But it, and then the reason why you do it, is it, is it pretty much creative control? Yeah, creative control. Also, um, having the rights, and so I can give them basically, so I can give them away for free. Right. So I have, for example, app developers asking me, "Hey, I'm starting this mobile app. Can I use your music?" And when the music belongs to me, I can say, "Yeah, sure, no problem. Just use it," you know. And which for me, for example, became a huge thing because some of those apps became really successful okay. with hundreds of millions of downloads now. So I got back to the developers and said, hey, now you're really successful. Can you start paying me for that? And they were like, yeah, sure, no problem. Okay. All that would have never happened if there would be a label and they would have said, no, you cannot use the music. It's really expensive. So then that would have never happened. Right. But I don't start those things to make money with it. I just love it when people get creative with my stuff. And I just can only allow everybody to get creative with my music if it stays my music. As soon as I give away the rights to another label, then that's their right. thing to make all those decisions. But so in that sense, when you finish a track, is it, is it then done for you? And do you kind of let it out into the world and any, anybody can do with it what they will? Yeah, sort of. Okay. So for me, I, I just love it when people get creative with my music. And uh, with my ideas, I also want to start now giving away the artworks as even the put out the Photoshop file so you have the layers mm, so if you just okay. want to take the background and you would want to put something different in there you can do that okay. you know just give people the opportunity to get creative with your creations what what can you give me one example of a interpretation of something you did that you really enjoyed oh uh, one that I uploaded was um, there's this game called Undertale mm. with a, the soundtrack sort of became a meme okay. and someone because I made the project for my song Unity open source, someone took the project and put in the melody from Undertale. Okay. And it became really huge and be became really successful. It never would have happened um, if, some were, if I wouldn't have sure. made the project files popular. And it was sort of iconic because a famous Twitch streamer mm. was trolled with that song. Okay. Because he's a drummer, he drums along to songs, and in the beginning he thought it was my song, so he was drumming along, and then all of a sudden was a different melody, and he was like super confused. <laughs> I can imagine it's very, very liberating in a way to to have this approach to music, yeah. to not kind of feel possessive of it, but to to kind of let it be what yeah. it is. Um, and but because like, one of the questions I had then was, well, with how do you make money off it? Because it's it's a very let me put altruistic approach. I, I don't think a lot of people have that approach. Um, I, yeah, I'm in the great uh, situation, even before I started becoming an artist, I had a couple of songs that are out there. And, and also I did a lot of library music, okay. um, which still creates a lot of revenue. So right. even, even if I wouldn't make one cent from the fat red, I still, me and my family could live from okay. all the music that I did back then. So there, there's absolutely no pressure. So, but then on top comes like all the YouTube ad revenue and then of course streaming today. Like mm. all the stuff that's out there, it doesn't cut into my streaming revenue, it actually helps them. You know, and right. I think a lot of record labels are still in the mindset of selling CDs or maybe in the mindset of selling <laughs> vinyls, where it's like, oh, we need to protect from people copying our music. But today copying, you know, people listen are listening on the streaming, streaming platforms anyway. So 
the more the music gets out, the more they're going to listen on the streaming flat platform mm. versus 20 years ago where it was like, oh, it's available. I'm not going to buy the CD. Of course, then it did cut in the revenue. But today it's the opposite. But that kind of independence, not only from labels, but the kind of financial independence, that, that yeah. must allow you to kind of develop uh, Fat Rat the way you want it and yeah. to focus kind of clearly on... The, because one thing you're focusing on now, I think, is a music video. Yeah. So... Uh, how does a project like that start? Do you can you pretty much do whatever you want in a way? Yeah, um, that was another way because um, for the music videos, it was always clear to me that it either I want something really outstanding, right? Mm. Because I would, I I'm sure my fan base otherwise would be really disappointed. It would be just some something, you know. Mm. Um, so I knew either I would have to put a lot of effort in it and a lot of time, which I don't want to do because I want to be in the studio. Right. Um, or I would need a huge budget. So in this case, um, we found a sponsor, which is Rocket Phones, mm. and they're doing phones with a 3D screen, which is perfect for gaming. So we talked to them, we said, or well, they talked to us, and we found it, hey, it's great, let's use sponsor the video, and the phone fits perfectly in the video as well. So they, uh, they gave us a huge budget to do the video that we wanted. Right. So we had like 100% creative freedom, and I think it's beneficial for the fans because they get to know the product and it's beneficial for the sponsor because the, the fans get to know the product oh, sure. and it's special, beneficial for me because I get the video. And it's also beneficial for the fans again because they also get a great video. So it's right. a win-win-win situation. And this is a, it is obviously a different creative outlet than making music. So does that take some adjusting or do you kind of know or do you let the other people do that or how does that work? Um, so I have like this backstory for my songs in my head, mm. um, which is uh, implemented into the video. But okay. of course, everything else than the story, like the visual and creative execution, I leave that to the sure. pros. Sure. And thanks to big budget, I could hire like some really great guys. So uh, and I'm, what I've seen so f seen so far, it looks absolutely amazing. Is it how, how much of it is done now? Uh, so we we shot the video. Uh, the basic editing is done. They're doing a lot of CGI. A really high quality CGI at the moment, so I've seen some of the CGI and that looks really, really great. And what, what do you hope, uh, like you say, the fans and everybody kind of involved what would, will take away from it? Um, yeah, just to get more about the backstory from the music and also get even more drawn into a different world, so like, you know, um, Make it like a like almost like yeah like a vacation you know just <laughs> sure. escape from th this world and get somewhere else. And finally, then is uh, what else? Because it seems like you have uh, a lot of things going on, a lot of different projects. You don't like that. It just seems to me right now but, um, that you don't like to do the same thing over and over. You like to venture into different. Uh... Well, I I for my part love doing music. Okay. Like myself, I'm just doing the music, but I have a couple of ideas for example uh, we are doing a mobile game now mm. as well and I had the idea for a concept for a mobile game in my head for ages <laughs> really long time so that's also we now found people to work with me on the mobile okay. game we're going to do this but I'm not going to do it myself I'm sure. just giving the ideas I have the like the vision for it and then I want to find really great people who pick up that vision and they execute it that's like the best thing so I can stay in the studio and make music <laughs> sure but can I assume it's music based Sorry? Is it music based? The yes. Game? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, last question then. Uh, you say you prefer to kind of be in the studio. That's still the, the core of what you do. Yeah. Uh, so, what are you working on now? Uh, I, the last three days, I've been working, uh, preparing a show okay. for uh, ESL. So, the Dota 1, uh, mm. the, the ESL 1 Dota Finals, right. and I play there. And uh, I needed some orchestra parts to put into the mix okay. uh, that haven't just didn't exist. I'm mixing <laughs> it, but uh, I needed some orchestra uh, part that I've produced uh, the la last three days. And that's been so much fun, like huge epic orchestra and choir. <laughs> but that must be an interesting venue kind of to showcase your music as well. The yeah, absolutely. Um, it's all, also, also was a little challenging because when you're playing an um, uh, esports event, mm. people are not there for the music. Right. So the audience is completely different rather than you play a show and people come to see you. Because when, pe when I play a show somewhere in the world and as the Fat Red headlining, I know people are coming there to see me. So I play on my favorite, I put on my favorite records and everybody's like, yeah, 
<laughs> right? But if you play an <laughs> esports event, people are not there to see you. They're not even there to see music. So you have to keep that in your mind and think about what would they like rather than what's, <laughs> what's what I think is great. Right. I mean, I do what I, I think is great. Uh, but you, yeah, you still have to keep in mind to, to make it fit for the event. You want them to have a good time. Yeah, absolutely. And also, it's an it's a audience that sits <laughs> and not dancing. Sure. So it's a, it's, it's a different approach. This, is, this sounds very interesting. So I wish you the best of luck with it. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for your time for this interview. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.